Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today, since it is almost the end of the year, I'm just going to do a fun video and I'm going to share with you my top 10 books that I read this year. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and talk to me in the comments and check out my description box for links to my social media. By the way, I have changed my name on all social media now. I am Melissa Denise or Mel Denise, D-E-N-Y-C-E. -E. Okay, so let's get right into it. Counting from 10 down to one, here's my top 10 books that I read in 2020. Number 10, Her Gates Will Never Be Shut by Brad Jerzak. I actually did a book review on this book earlier this year, which I'll link for you guys. This book is perfect for anyone who's on the fence about universalism, specifically for people who are within the religion of Christianity and are looking for honest answers from a Christian perspective. So Brad Jerzak is an Eastern Orthodox minister, so he holds to typical Eastern Orthodox doctrine and he considers himself, like many of them do, a hopeful universalist. And what I love about this book, it is very biblically based for those who are looking for that. He deals honestly with the biblical text. He doesn't skim over or try to explain the difficult passages. He's comfortable having attention there and presenting all sides of the argument and letting the reader decide for themselves what they believe, but in spite of that, he manages to pull together an overwhelming argument for universalism. In this book, he goes through all the words in the Bible that are translated hell. He has a whole chapter, or maybe even more than a chapter, dedicated to the book of Revelation, which honestly, that's my favorite part of the book. This book actually made me cry, and that almost never happens. Um, but he he ends the book with this incredible word picture of the river of God flowing into the lake of fire and the thirsty souls within the lake of fire, which he does consider to be symbolic, by the way, um, hearing the voice of God coming from the throne in the city using symbolism from the book of Revelation. Um, but the voice of God calling those who are thirsty outside the gates, are you thirsty? Come and drink. And it's just, it's so powerful. I'm not going to give too much of it away, but if you are within Christianity and you're on the fence about universalism, you're struggling with some of the doctrines that you were raised to believe, this book is the book for you. Another thing that's great that I forgot to mention is that Brad Jerzak is really, really well versed in what the early church fathers believed. And so he pulls that into his argument as well. Um, I learned some things that surprised me that I didn't know about early church doctrine in this book. Number nine, Sinners in the Hands of a Loving God by Brian Zond. I read this book with my reading group this year, which by the way, my link is in the comments if you would like to join. This book, really what it does is it questions the traditional evangelical understanding of the cross and what it accomplished. So this book again is written from a very Christian perspective. So if you're within the Christian religion and you want to stay true to the uh, foundational Christian doctrines, um, but you're really starting to feel uncomfortable with some of the way those doctrines have been interpreted and some of the things that you've been taught, um, Brad Jerzak and Brian Zahn both are great authors. And I've read multiple of their books this year, but this book made my list because Brian Zond is a brilliant author. And Brad Jerzak and Brian Zond are both similar when it comes to their theology, but I find that I prefer listening to Brad Jerzak as opposed to reading him because he has this huge heart and so much love and care for people that really comes out when he speaks. But Brian Zond, I prefer to read because he is a brilliant author. He just has a way with words. Reading this this book and then his other book that I read this year, Postcards from Babylon, was just as excellent, but it is more of a political nature, so I didn't include it in my list. But both of his books, anytime I read anything written by Brian Zond, oh, he also blogs. You should, I'll link his blog below. You should look it up. He's a genius 
with words. He just blows me away every time. But what I love about this book is he really attacks the penal substitutionary atonement theory. He also deals again with the book of Revelation and reframes it in a way that will just blow your mind. So he answers the question of what was the sacrifice of Christ all about and, and how do we understand God through this picture of Jesus Christ that we've been given. A similar book to this one, written by Brad Jerzak, I also recommend. It's called A More Christ-Like God, and I don't have it with me right here, otherwise I would show you, but we read that one in my reading group also. I just prefer Brian Zahn's writing style, um, but both of these men, they are exactly what evangelical Christianity needs right now. Number eight, The Physics of God. So this book, the author of this book was going to school for the sciences and he has a family history in the sciences and then he ended up having a transcendent spiritual experience which changed the course of his life and he ended up getting a degree in philosophy. So he is well versed both in science, philosophy and religion and he wrote this book to sort of bridge the gap and make the point that religion and science are both speaking the same language using different words. And so he quotes um, scientists, saints, sages, near-death experiences, the great Eastern masters. He just, he, he deals with a lot of different subject matter and pulls it all together, bridging the gap between science and spirituality in a way that's actually really understandable and easy to read. I lose track of time when I read this book. Number seven, The Inescapable Love of God by Thomas Talbot. I read this book with my brother Stephen. We actually read several books together this year which was so much fun. But this is a book on universalism written from a Christian perspective and very biblically based. This book is probably the most intellectual book on universalism that I have ever read. And I'll be honest, um, there were a couple chapters where I was getting a little bit lost, which rarely happens to me, and I'll explain why in a couple minutes. But this book is divided into three sections, and the second section is really a comprehensive review of the New Testament in light of universalism, and he deals with all the difficult texts from some of Jesus' parables to some of the teachings of Paul, specifically one that really stood out to me is he talks about the passage where Paul discusses the vessels of wrath, which was always a problematic text for me. Unlike Brad Jerzak, where Brad Jerzak will try to hold that tension and let the difficult passages say the worst and argue for universalism in spite of that, Talbot just demolishes the difficulties in this text. It's an overwhelming argument for universalism. In the third section of his book, he gets into the logic of universalism a bit, and that's where I was getting lost because I wasn't fully following some of his arguments until Stephen explained to me that Talbot was arguing for process theology, which I understand what that is. I didn't connect the dots that that's what he was arguing for. And once I understood that, it made more sense. But having said that, this book is absolutely fantastic if you want an intellectual read that overwhelmingly argues for universalism this is your book book number six the power of now this book made my list because it turned out to be extremely helpful in my own growth and it actually is very similar to a course in miracles in its content in the sense that it is a non-dual text. However, I did not understand that when I picked it up earlier this year. So I picked this book up probably in January, February of this year, and I got to about chapter three, and intellectually I understood what he was talking about. So he talks a lot about um, being in the now moment and how being in the now is your salvation and where you'll find freedom from suffering. And it honestly wasn't really resonating with me because I'm thinking, okay, you have to do more than just be in the now moment to be saved. And I wasn't really understanding where he was coming from. 
And then a couple of weeks ago, I picked it back up because I said the year is coming to a close. I should probably finish all the books I started just so I can say that I read them. So I picked it up and began reading it again. And all of a sudden, I understood exactly what he was talking about. Because I've spent this entire year studying A Course in Miracles and doing A Course in Miracles workbook, going through the lessons day by day. And I've spent the past several months since Aaron Abke did his Remember I Am challenge, doing a daily self-inquiry practice, which is basically finding the I am presence within you, that the presence of God, that place where you and God are connected and living from that place. Then I picked this book up and all of a sudden I realized that when he says the power of the now or the power of the present moment, it's what I've been calling the I am presence because the I am is in the now. So he's using language to describe the same reality that was just tripping me up in the beginning. So then I just binge read this book and it all made sense to me. And I actually got some really helpful tips from this book to add to my practice. So come to this book with the understanding that when he says the power of now, he's talking about the I am presence of God within you. And to be honest, he even explains that in the beginning. He says that he's using words like being and now to describe the creator or what religious people would call God, but all of that just went over my head the first time. Um, another thing that I love about this book is that it helps me connect the dots between the teachings of Jesus and some of the more non-dual teachings of Eastern religions. Particularly, I love this quote right from the very beginning of the book on page 12. Those who have not found their true wealth, which is the radiant joy of being, capital B, and the deep unshakable peace that comes with it are beggars, even if they have great material wealth. They are looking outside for scraps of pleasure or fulfillment, for validation, security, or love. While they have a treasure within that not only includes all those things, but is infinitely greater than anything the world can offer. So of course, when I hear that statement, the first thing that comes to mind is the parable of the hidden treasure. The treasure that was buried within the ground, which the, the ground or the soil in Jesus' parables is a reference to the heart. So the treasure that's buried within the heart that's worth selling everything else for. All right, number five, I actually have two for the price of one here. These are Joe Dispenza's books, Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself and Becoming Supernatural. Now I've been following Joe Dispenza since about 2017, 2018. Basically when my life was at its lowest point, I stumbled across him on YouTube and my life changed overnight because of his teachings. Um, and I devoured every single lecture online that I could find, did every meditation that I could find. And these two books, I finally read them this year. They contain all the information that you'll find in any of his online lectures, plus um, a lot more case studies, a lot more of his own personal story. And he goes into detail on his meditations, the steps to take with them, and how to make sure that they're effective in your life. What Dr. Joe teaches is that we are perceiving and through perceiving, creating our world through our state of being. So if we are living from a place of lack and misery and disconnect and fear, then we're going to be experiencing and creating a fearful world and we'll reap the consequences of that in our life. When you realize who you truly are, that you are an infinite, abundant spiritual being, that you are connected to your source and you start living from that place of satisfaction and joy and fulfillment, then that's what you will reflect and create in your reality. And through implementing his suggestions and his meditations into my daily life, I saw an overnight change. I mean, everything changed overnight. And I could go into a lot of detail about this, but I won't because that's not the point of this video. Just his books go into detail on how to rewire your mind and your inner state to change your reality. Uh, the more Christian in my audience would probably say this is law of attraction, new age nonsense. And he definitely has his critics, but what he says works, at least it did for me. And another thing that I appreciate about him is that he's very scientific in his approach. He doesn't really use new age language. He tends to stick with um, the language of science 
and explaining what he's talking about. Number four, this is My Descent Into Death by Howard Storm. This is the story of Howard Storm's near-death experience. Now, I've read a lot of near-death experience stories. Howard Storm's will always be my favorite because he was like my gateway drug into near-death experiences. His story is very Christian in the sense that he saw and had an extended conversation with Jesus and he experienced going to hell, being saved from hell by Jesus. One of the things that I most love about this book is that Howard had a chance to ask Jesus any question that he wanted to ask him and get all of his questions answered. And he goes into a lot of detail on those questions and what the answers were in this book. While we're on this topic, I actually have something really exciting that I wanna share with you guys. I'm going to be having Howard Storm on the channel soon. I will post you guys with an update and more details later, but I just want to say if there are any questions that you would like me to ask him during my interview with him, please leave them in the comments section. I will also do an Instagram post probably next week where you can leave questions as well. Number three, I actually do not have because I listened to the audiobook but it is The Universal Christ by Richard Rohr. So The Universal Christ is written by a modern day Christian mystic. And I think it is the first book on Christian mysticism that I have ever read. And let me tell you what, guys, it ranks high up on my list because it brings together the worlds of Christianity and then everything else that's over here that's sort of grouped together. New Age, Eastern philosophy, so a lot of times I feel the tension between these two worlds because I get people from both sides of the equation watching my videos. And those who are really still in the Christian world, a lot of times will say I'm too new age in my philosophy. And those who are more on the new age side of things will say I'm too Christian. And there really is this extreme polarity that I found between the two groups because they're so offended by each other. You know, because Christians think New Agers are demonic and New Agers a lot of times were raised in fundamentalist religion and hurt by it. So they're triggered by any Christian terminology. And I kind of see it as my calling to sort of bridge the gap as much as I can and, and, and show people, hey, we're talking about the same thing here. But the world of Christian mysticism is just like such a breath of fresh air for me in that regard to say, yes, these beliefs do fit together and Christ is the key to all of it and Richard Rohr really brings that out in his book. Um, Richard Rohr really brings the world to life, I would say, in his description of Christ being all and in all, as the Apostle Paul puts it. Number two, That All Shall Be Saved by David Bentley Hart. This book is the most magnificent book on universalism I have ever read and one of my very favorite books that I have ever read. I believe this was the first book that I read with my brother Stephen this year. And then we also read it later in the year in my discussion group. This book is very intellectual. He likes to use a lot of big words and long sentences. Some people in my group have said that listening to it is easier for them than reading it. But I say whatever you have to do, even if you have to sit there with a dictionary right next to you, just it is so worth the read, you will not regret it. Unlike the other two books on universalism that made my list, this one is not biblically based. There's not much about the Bible in here. There is some, but mostly it is philosophical and logical arguments for universalism and his arguments are impeccable. He understands world religions and their developments and how they all fit together. So that comes out in this book a little bit. His critics, say that he's too harsh towards the infernalist viewpoint. Um, I really disagree. <laughs> I found his flowery language and his brutal honesty to be a great combination in this book and very refreshing. This is by far the best book on universalism I've ever read. All right, I'm sure you guys can guess what my number one is gonna be. <laughs> a Course in Miracles, this book changed my life. So A Course in Miracles, for anybody who does not know, is it's not a religious text. It is a spiritual self-study guide 
towards enlightenment and spiritual liberation. So freedom from suffering. Really, it is all about forgiveness. And when the Course says forgiveness, it means learning to see the world the way it is, to see the formless, unchanging reality of God's creation that is whole and perfect in every way and to stop living in our illusions of separation and fear. I've never, never had anything help me progress and grow spiritually as fast as this book has. The text and the workbook, the text is good for a foundational knowledge, but the workbook is really what helps you put it into practice. And that's what I love about this because there's 365 days in the workbook and each day is one small step in the right direction. This book will help you find God, it will help you see the world the way it is, and it will free you from things that you thought you never even thought you needed freedom from. All right, those are my 10 books, my top 10 books that I have loved reading this year. Please share yours with me in the comments. Please share your book suggestions. I'm going through right now and coming up with my reading list for my discussion group for 2021. And I love to hear your ideas. Be loved, be happy, be at peace, and thank you for watching. <music>